Um, so our second session this morning about uh, Boot uh, will involve James Hunt, who's been working for Canonical uh, on Upstart for the past uh, three years, and also Steve Langashek, who also is working for Canonical, but is a, most of us know him for his long time commitment for the on Debian for the past 13 years. Uh, this morning together they're going to tell us why Debian needs to have start. Please welcome them. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, as, as uh, Lunar mentioned, I'm Steve. Many of you know me already. I've been around here and there in Debian for a few years. Vorlon. Yeah. Uh, and James Hunt is the uh, upstream maintainer for Upstart, so we've come here today to tell you about uh, e everything Upstart and why we should have Upstart uh, in Debian and why we should be using Upstart in Debian. We had uh, discussions yesterday about uh, System D and what it has to offer, and so we'd like to show you today a little bit about um, Upstart and why, why it is uh, the thing you should use instead of System D for PID1. And with that, I'll turn it over to James for the first part. Great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, apologies, uh, we've got a 45 minute session. I'll be talking for the first 15, giving over you design architecture and some examples of facilities that Upstart has allowed. We've had to pack a lot in today. Uh, like, in fact, other speakers have said before us, um, if we're talking too fast, please slow us down. And if you have a chat afterwards, please come grab us, because there's a lot more we could be saying, but. Okay. Um, so, what did Upstart? It's, it's a, oh, reason to lose the mic. It's a revolutionary event-based init system. It was written by Keybuck. It's now maintained by Canonical and developed by ourselves in the community. It's been PID1 on every system, every Ubuntu system since 2006. Of course, it handles boot, shutdown, server supervision. Um, we also provide support for Sys5 jobs, transparent. And of course, Upstart is now a first class in Debian. As you can see, there's no point in reading out the names here, but it, it runs on pretty much uh, all the major players, all the major systems right now. Um, and the important one, of course, is the bottom one. It has excellent platform presence. Uh, it runs on desktop servers, embedded devices, thin clients, cloud, tablets, and most recently, phones. Just touching on cloud for a second, I mean, Upstart is the number one in its system in the cloud due to Ubuntu's dominance in that realm. And there's no point in reading out the names, but there's, there's some examples of big companies that are using Ubuntu in the cloud and Ubuntu on servers. Um, it's very important for us to point out that Upstart's a very simple program. It's simple, but it's also very versatile, very flexible. Um, the the init daemon itself really understands two concepts, only two concepts, events and processes. So uh, it doesn't dictate run level policy. The init daemon doesn't even know what a run level is. We'll, we'll, we'll show examples of this later on. So when we talk about run levels, this is currently specific to Ubuntu and Debian. So <laughs> I had a funny room yesterday. Uh, just to clarify, Upstart is actually written in C, <laughs> not Python. <laughs> um, we, we attempt to adhere to the Unix philosophy of doing one thing and doing it well. Um, as I said, the core of Upstart is very simple. It does include a dbus server, for, as we'll, and we'll see why that is later on, um, but we only provide uh, methods that are, that are core to management. Additional functionality is handled by bridges. They run out of process, they, they enhance the facilities, the, the abilities of Upstart. And we do that to provide resilience against system failure. We'll cover bridges in a little bit in a few slides time. The way they're handled, again, is very elegant, very simple, very Scott. Um, of course, one of the unique selling points of Upstart is the fact that it's event-based. This is revolutionary, OK? Um, again, we'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, but it, seeing this, this bottom point here, Upstart makes use of the NIH library. Yes, it might, might stand for not invented here. It's a very cut down, um, safe, small library. Can I give me another battery? Uh, you can. <laughs> um, it was written specifically for early boot systems such as Upstart. Thank you. So the, the core of Upstart itself, really, apart from the init daemon, is, is one command in its CTL. So with that, you can actually control jobs. You can query certain aspects of, of uh, the jobs themselves. And uh, thank you. Um, init CTL itself being a, a Dbus client that basically right. talks directly to Init, which runs a, a Dbus protocol on its own endpoint. Uh, right. The the Dbus interface is very well defined. I mean, you can write you know your own uh, your own applications to make use of that. 
Um, Upstart has the same declarative job, job syntax. Uh, we'll see examples of that in a second. We read job files from ETC in it. We support uh, files. Common. We lost it again. <laughs> we support override files, which are um, familiar to Debian users, I'm sure. So we can actually change the behavior of a job without touching the pristine files. That's a very, very powerful facility. Um, file system mounting, yep, as it says here, it's handled by another helper. It's not a bridge per se, but it's, a, it's another helper application called Mount Tool. Um, it mount file, mount file system in parallel. Um, this is by design. This was not a mistake. Um, again, it's out of, it's out of, out of the core uh, PID1 namespace. Um, when mounting these file systems that happen to say in parallel, we have a very rich uh, uh, palette of events that are available to jobs. Um, and we've got some references here to man pages. So you can find a Ubuntu system, take a look at those. So uh, Alp starts event-based. Um, jobs, as we'll see, start very naturally. They start at the right time. They start when it's time for that particular job, when all of its, its, uh, its, 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 uh, its start conditions are satisfied. So it, it's very much, it's unlike System 5, where you, know, you have a sequential start, you have to assign a number, set the order, it doesn't have complex dependency resolvers. Um, and one further point I would add there is um, you're probably used to thinking of Sys5 in it as a thing that runs at boot time, um, boots the system, and then gets out of the way. Well, uh, that's OK if you have a very static system. But if you're in a dynamic environment where you have hardware that comes and goes, if you have network devices that come and go, you want something more dynamic. You want a system that will continue to um, you know, understand what the state of the system should be overall throughout the, the life cycle of the, of the, the system. And so the fact that it's event-based rather than dependency-based means that it responds to events that happen any time during the system, uh, system's boot time, and uh, throughout, throughout the, the uptime of the system. Um, so it's not just a, a job starts once and runs forever and that's it. Um, it's a very expressive language where you can have uh, jobs that come and go in response to hardware events throughout the, the uptime. Yeah, that, that kind of leads to one of Scott's favorite phrases, I think, where he described Upstart as, uh, it's a system where the system <clears throat> just keeps on booting effectively. It keeps on reacting to events as they're emitted, keeps on reacting, starting and stopping jobs as appropriate. So here's a very simple job uh, in the box here. We've got four lines, four lines that count. Um, we specify when the job started. So here we're saying start when the debug service has started. Um, you can guess what the stop on line is doing. Stop when the system shut down. I think we use mode reboot. Um, exact line, what we're running here, what is the service? And expect daemon, well, we're saying that the my daemon here is a real double forking daemon. Um, so the start and stop on conditions here are very, very simple. They should only be very simple. However, we do support, you know, arbitrary complexity, logical operators and that kind of thing. Um, but as a rule of thumb, if you've got more than three, three events, because this is worth pointing out, the started event, the started there is, a, is an event. Um, <clears throat> more than three events in a start or stopping condition, you need to think quite carefully because all jobs should be simple like this. So what does that actually give you? Well, it obviously tells the upstart how to start and stop the service. It also allows an administrator to manually, forcibly stop or start the job. What isn't shown is the fact that upstart provides automatic logging. That's all handled kind of transparently. And of course, a minimal environment is provided for, for each job. Um, it's very human readable. I mean, this is upstart specific syntax, but you can guess what that's doing, right? But there's no, you know, there's no sort of particular magic in understanding what that's saying. Um, and of course, crucially, unlike system five, you don't have huge chunks of boilerplate LSB code. You know, you let upstart do the heavy lifting. So this is probably not going to come across very well to you guys at the back there, but this is attempting to show um, some of the events that are omitted when a job is started and stopped. So I'll just run through it briefly. Um, the sort of purpley boxes here are showing the events. So <clears throat> when a circuit is, 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 uh, is starting, we emit an event called starting. And that event can be used by other jobs. You start on starting foo. And you can have a job react to that. Um, further down, you then, you see the PID box on the right here. We run the exec line. So if we go back to the example, we exec my daemon, foo equals bar. When that, that, that de daemon's running, we emit the started, because obviously we, you know, we, we've realized that, that's, that, that, uh, that state now. But again, when you, when you stop the daemon, upstart emits a stopping event and a stopped. The other black boxes are, are sort of optional 
um, job processes, as they're called. So an example we support, we're showing exec here, you can have a script, you can actually have some shell code, if you like. So the, and in fact, the stanza, the, the keyword, is called script. Um, so you can have a script on exec, that's known as the main process, but optionally you can have these other types of process pre-start. So you can run something before the main job starts. You can do whatever you like. Mm -hmm. You can run something after the main process post-start, and, and again, pre-stop, post-stop. They're all, in fact, they're all optional. In fact, even the main exec and script is optional. You can have a legitimate job that doesn't actually fork anything at all. And they're very useful. They're called abstract jobs, but we, can't, we don't have time to discuss this today, unfortunately. Um, so we mentioned earlier on, Upstart supports Sys5. You don't have to modify your jobs anyway, your, your services anyway. It reads the files from the user location. It provides the usual set of commands, shut down, reboot, tell in it, and so on. But what's really interesting about Upstart is the fact that it emulates the run level. The commands will do exactly what you expect them to do. But if we just look at, uh, at how that works, it's quite fascinating, I think. So to, to reiterate, the init daemon knows nothing about run levels, okay? It just knows about event. So how does this all work? Well, it's actually very simple. There are two jobs. There's an rc sys init job, and this is pretty much it in the first box. And you can kind of guess again, you know, it's, it's human readable. Start on file system and static network up. It's actually saying start when all the file systems are mounted. And that, that actually, that, that event, file, uh, file systems coming from mount all. So basically start, you know, when your system's in a sort of reasonable, you know, uh, state. Um, you've, got, you've got networking, you've got writable disks and so on. And then, exec tell init, default run level two. Okay, so tell init runs, passing a parameter two. Tell init itself emits an event called run level. It's pretty, pretty obvious, very natural. And then we have another job called RC, which starts on run level. This is actually a sort of, a map, a, a sort of pattern match here we can do. So this RC job will only start in you know, recognized run levels. And what that does is it execs etz init.d rc, passing run level. So that, that basically is it. That allows upstart to support system five. Init demon knows nothing about it, nothing about uh, run levels. If you want more details, look at the man page, run level seven. So bridges, they're really cool. They're one of my favorite aspects right now. Um, they allow you to extend upstart in whatever way you want. They run out of process. Um, what's really cool about bridges is that they actually run as upstart jobs. So they're extending upstart and they're running as a job <laughs> managed by upstart. So heaven forbid, but I mean, if a, if a bridge were to crash, that's not a problem because upstart will restart it. Uh, and the whole point of a bridge is that it, it, it basically enriches the, the palette of events in some way. It injects new events into the system. So unfortunately, we don't have really time to talk through all this stuff, but here's some examples of the bridges we have. So we have a UDEV bridge. So all the UDEV events are injected into Upstart. So you can have jobs which do crazy cool things. In fact, I think Steve's got an example of this coming up. We've got a file bridge. We can, we can, we can react and have jobs start on when a file's modified in a particular directory and when a debus signal is, is emitted or something like that. It's very, very clever. And the, there's a very, um, very detailed manual page called Upstart Events, which summarizes the, sort of the well-known um, well events. They, there's, there's actually a lot of uh, parity between those events and sort of the LSB-defined uh, conditions, I guess, and there's, there's the magic LSB headers. Um, it's worth looking at that page. But if you can't find what you, what you want, I mean, if you want a, want a job that reacts to some specific part of the system, it's not detailed in upstart events, what do you do? Well, you can talk to us. We're quite approachable. We're happy to write, uh, write new bridges. If you'd like to write a bridge yourself, it's, it's, not, it's not a major piece of, piece, piece of work. Skeleton bridge is only 300 lines of code. You can actually write a program, which just makes use of lib upstart. Again, that will just allow you to generate events. Or you can just call in its CTL, emit event. And that is in no way a second class citizen. Um, you know, you can legitimately write a bridge in shell, shell script if you like, just have a loop that, that, that emits, that, that calls in its CTL emit. And that's all being, you know, that's, that's creating new events, put them into the system, there's one event namespace, so all jobs have access to all of these, mm -hmm. these events. Um, so just briefly, we've, we've got some utilities that Upstart provides. There's a graph, as you should see, so you can see how uh, events relate to start and stop on conditions. 
um, which is actually quite interesting. You know, you look at uh, the weather system boots, upstart monitor. Well, if I say dbus monitor, you'll understand it's pretty much the same thing. You can watch event flows in real time. That's the GUI shit screenshot. It, it runs on the console as well. And the, the, all, the all important init check conf. So that'll basically syntax check your job. It'll also check the, the source code, the, the, sorry, the, the shell code, if there is, is any in there as well. So run that, init, run it, check conf, check conf before kind of deploying your, your job for testing. So just briefly, we're going to give you um, some examples of some enablements, some of the things that, that Upstart's allowed, sort of um, due to its design, really. Um, the first one, cloud init. Uh, I think it was mentioned at the Google talk yesterday. It's written by Scott, Scott, Scott Moser of Canonical. It's a very clever um, application which sort of solves the problem of how do you, um, how do you configure a generic cloud guest? Because these guests are extremely minimal. They're a server image, minimal packets, pa uh, package set. As it says here, initially, you can't log into them. They didn't do anything. They just, they'll boot and that's it. <laughs> So um, cloud in it kind of fills that, that space. Um, if you imagine you wanted to sort of deploy 100 guests, 25 web servers, 10 database backends, proxies, caches, and that kind of thing, cloud in it will do that for you. So it's not just doing sort of the same boiler print setup for, for every, single cloud, every single guest. Yeah, were people here for the, the talk? I think it was yesterday morning, James Romberger was talking about uh, AWS and, uh, and cloud in it. Are people familiar with cloud in it and, and what that enables? And, and have you guys seen that? So it's, it's, it's been kind of a, an issue with getting Debian enabled in Amazon on account of the fact that uh, Cloud in it was written to leverage Upstart very heavily. And it has been ported now into Debian. Um, Tomo Guaran has done a port of Cloud in it to work with uh, Sys5 in its systems. Um, I'm, personally, I'm somewhat skeptical that it's going to provide the same functionality because Cloud in it um, very heavily um, leverages some of the functionality of Upstart in terms of being able to interpose. Uh, jobs that hook into different points in the boot sequence and, and stick themselves in between on, on arbitrary events, which, you know, to a certain degree, you can do the same kind of thing with Sys5 and it, uh, with LSB sequencing. Um, I don't think it actually gives us the same flexibility that we have in, in Upstart and Cloud Init. Um, and so I, it'll be interesting to see how well that actually works for people in practice, but Cloud Init is a, is a huge, it leverages Upstart very well and, and really speaks to Upstart's strengths. Yeah, so here's, here's an example of really, well, it's an example. It's showing you how Cloud Init is actually working. Um, the, the box at the top shows you the main Cloud Init job. The way Cloud Init does work is it deploys a number of upstart jobs. Um, they're, 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 they're within the Cloud Init package in this cut down guest. Um, that it, those three lines are extremely important, extremely clever. So, again, you know, it's pretty readable. Start on mounted, mount point equals slash. So, this job is going to start when, the, when the, the root file is mounted. Task means run this as a kind of a single shot program, it's not a daemon. It's going to run an exit. That's it. Um, what is it going to do before it exits? It's going to run the cloud init program, specifying a parameter there. The point is, though, well, there are two important points. One, mounted is a blocking event. Okay? So the upstart will not kind of uh, free up that event. It will not uh, discard it until this, this job has finished. Okay? Mm -hmm. Until this task has actually finished uh, running. So what, what cloud init is actually doing is it saying, you know, well, Upstart is going to start this, this job very early in the boot. Cloud init is then going to set the host name, set up SSH, talk securely to, you know, management uh, servers and determine what type of guest this should be, what, what package set, what configuration it needs, handle installing all those packages and, and, and configuring them. And, and interestingly enough, um, one thing cloud init does is it actually app get upgrades in early boot. And of course, that could result in Upstart itself being upgraded in early boot. But that's fine, because Upstart supports stateful re-exec. It just works. Um, so once Cloud in the, the, the job has finished, the system is now a database server. It started off as a, as a clean slate vanilla server. The job runs. Suddenly, it's a database server, and the boot continues. Absolutely brilliant, I think. It's, 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 so this, again, some references to, to man pages there to look at. but. Um, yeah, talk to Scott Moser, have a look at the, the documentation on Cloud Init. Very clever. This is very clever. <laughs> I, I, friendly recovery, okay. Um, here it is. Um, friendly recovery allows uh, even a naive user to fix their system. Some users might log in as root and delete a load of files, whoops. So what do you do? Well, Ubuntu provides this, this facility, so if you select recovery from the, the, the grub boot menu, you end up being dropped into this menu. You can 
select an appropriate option, FCK or you know fixed D package or something, um, and yeah, it'll all just work. It makes basically clever use of upstart to temporarily subvert the system boot. So let's see how it does that. So the user selects recovery from the, init, uh, the, the grub boot menu. That results in the init wrap FS, starting upstart in the box at the top here, specifying this option to basically change the initial event. Normally, upstart will emit the startup event. That is the first, uh, that, that's the way that, uh, that the system starts to boot. That one event has to be reacted to. But here we're changing it to recovery. And unsurprisingly, there's a, there's a job called friendly recovery, which specifies start on recovery. So the user selects recovery from the grub menu, upstart starts, emits that event, runs the friendly recovery job, whoops, wrong way, <laughs> um, which drops the user into the, the menu. They fix their system, they, they tab down to OK, press return, and then what happens is at the end of the, the job, we run a post stop here. The post stop runs in its CTL emit startup, which as I just said is normally the, the way the system boots. So the overall result being the user is dropped into the menu, they, they, they fix their system, the menu exits, now hopefully the, with a fixed system, and the system can boot as normal. Ah, right, this is Steve's very clever example. So I get to talk about this one. Uh, I couldn't resist putting this together in, in preparation for the presentation. This is actually something I've been meaning to do with my own uh, GPG setup for a while now. And, and since there were some, some questions coming up on the, the mailing list just before DevConf about best practices for, G, for GPG, um, you know, I thought this would be an opportune time to, to do something about that. Um, so, you know, nowadays lots of people use, th with their GPG keys, they have sub keys and you, you know, you might put your sub key for your daily use on your laptop or on a different machine so that you, 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 it's, it's always online, it's convenient for you, but it's also revocable without too much hassle. Well, then that means that you, you have a master key somewhere that you're, you're putting uh, somewhere more secure. Well, what, is, what does more secure mean? It means it's offline, uh, but it also means it should be resilient to failure um, and not stealable. And so the best way to actually have your, your master key offline is if you do, uh, who, who here has actually used GF Share? Are you familiar with, with this? Few people, few people, yeah. Um, it's a great little tool that uh, um, Daniel Silverstone, um, I don't think he's currently active in Debian, but he's a, he at one time was a Debian developer, um, which he wrote, which allows you to take uh, you know, an arbitrary piece of data and uh, split it into, well, split it into different pieces, any one of which or any, uh, you, you can split it into M pieces, um, requiring n of them to reconstitute the, the thing. And if you have n minus one pieces, it gives you no information. So, I mean, the math behind this is actually fairly simple, uh, but I won't go into that here. But what, what I really want is, okay, I have a master key. Um, I want to split it into, say, three parts. I put one part in escrow somewhere safe that I don't touch, but it's there as a backup in case I have a hardware failure on one of the other pieces. Um, I put one on my laptop, and I put one on a USB key, so that when I need to reconstitute it, I just plug my USB key into my laptop um, and, and reconstitute it there. Well, I don't want to have to reconstitute it by hand, because that's just annoying. So here, for example, is a, is a, uh, a simple upstart job, which, rel which uh, leverages the fact that um, this is currently Ubuntu specific. Ubuntu in 13.10 is using upstart not just for managing the system, but also managing user sessions. So when you do a, a graphical login in Ubuntu 13.10, uh, upstart runs as a user session manager, um, starts all, the, all the, the related processes instead of using you know, GNOME session and running .desktop files. It, it makes use of the fact that upstart has its, its uh, process supervision and everything um, to run through the jobs, start them in the correct order, uh, and also ensure that they, they shut down correctly when the session ends. So that's actually one of the things we, we saw certainly with GNOME session is sometimes jobs would not get shut down. And I think System D um, has, has dealt with this problem in a similar way. I mean, so you guys use C groups to make sure that um, any the processes don't escape the end of the session. Um, in this case, we're not using C groups. Um, it hasn't been necessary for the, the things we're trying to accomplish, uh, but just the fact that we have Process supervision means we're, we're successfully capturing things and, and shutting them down at the end of the session that weren't being uh, shut down before. But it also means that you can easily extend the behavior of your user session um, 
keying on hardware level events because using upstart in the user session means you have basically the same view of system events all the way through the stack from, from the kernel to udev to the system upstart to the user upstart. So for example here, we have a job which starts on colon sys block dash device added, which is just a, the, the upstart translation of, of uh, the event equals, what is it, event equals add, et cetera, et cetera, that you would see if you were, if you were you know, running udev add a monitor or something. Um, and we, we pattern match and say, well, look for the first partition that shows up on the device that has this serial number, because I want to specify to only do this when my particular USB stick is installed. Um, and then we want it to go ahead and combine things. Now, this is not ideal here. This, this one, you know, we, we have a, a, a timeout in here. I'm, I'm saying wait five seconds, because we're not getting events for, for UDISCs when UDISC mounts the device in the user session. We, we don't, we're not getting any events off of that. So we get the UDEV event, but we don't actually get any, anything telling us that the, the, the file system is mounted. So that's not ideal. But uh, in terms of implementation difficulty, it's not too, too shabby. Um, and so we just have this here that, um, you know, called GF combine with uh, targeting, this is XDG runtime dir, which is, um, if you're using upstart in a user session, uh, upstart respects the XDG spec to ensure that that's a, um, a user only writable share on um, basically a, a RAM disk, so it's not persistent across boots. Um, so that's safe for us to write this kind of data to without it getting, getting written to disk. I mean, it may be swapped out, but in, for the most part, this is safe. Um, safer than writing it out to a disk somewhere and having to worry about deleting it later. Um, and we also have a, a post stop script. So this shows, this shows both the example of, a, this is an example of a job that has a pre-start script, a post stop script, and no, no main exec line in between. So the job is considered running with no process associated with it once the pre-start script has completed. And then this job is running and, and upstart keeps track of that. So when it gets the event that triggers the stop, which is you pull the USB stick out, uh, it goes ahead and runs the post stop script and make sure it cleans up your, your data automatically for you. So it's a, it's a clean little way to, to you know, it's a, it's a nice little trick for managing GBG keys. So I figured I'd show this here. Um, and, you know, the key thing here, you can key on any UDEV event at all, any attributes of the event that's all exposed. Um, the upstart monitor uh, helper, which, which James showed earlier, it's a nice GUI that you can just run it and see what events come through. Um, you know, plug your USB stick in for a test, see what events happen, cut and paste, you know, copy paste from the GUI and, and uh, build some upstart jobs around whichever events you want to, so. Great, thanks Steve. So just to finish up my section, uh, the enablements we've covered really <coughs> are, uh, are allowed, they're facilitated by the fact that upstart allows any job to hook into any part of the boot process. And that, you have to just think about that. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you know, Whatever your use case is, this will do it for you. Um, but also the fact that we have uh, blocking events. This is all documented in the man pages. Um, so we can pause, essentially pause an event. Um, and finally, a friend recovery makes use of the fact that you can essentially subvert the system boot temporarily. As long as a startup event is emitted at some point, um, you know, your system's good. So friendly recovery switches to a recovery path, does its recovery, and then switches back to the main boot path. And yeah, as, as we got the last point here, um, the fact that with, with 13.10, you know, you can make use of upstart running as a user as well. And as Steve's example showed, you get the sys, cutting sys cut on preview, uh, prefix. So you can write, um, write a, a job which makes use of, of system level events that's kind of name spaced off, so you can have your own events as well, of course, your level, but you can react to any system level event, UDEV, iNotify, whatever you want, Dbus. And with that, I'll pass over to Steve. Follow-up comment on the, on the GPG job that I showed there. Uh, of course, I, I say that this is something that I wrote just uh, in preparation for this talk. Interesting story. In the process of that, I had previously been keeping my master key on a USB stick which when I went to go prepare this talk, I found that the media had degraded. <laughs> <laughs> so
So I only just managed to recover my master GPG key off of, off of that media and, and implement this for it just in, in time for the talk. Um, so this is a good idea to do this. Don't just keep your master GPG key on a USB stick and expect the media will last forever. Apparently the lifespan of some of these is, you know, six years or so. So we've shown you a little bit of the, the architecture of Upstart and, and, and some of its features and <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's an unexpected event. I'm not handling that. I have no jobs to start on that. Um, so we've, we've looked at the architecture of Upstart, shown some of its features, some of, some of what makes it distinct from, from other Internet systems. But really, the, the, the question we want to address here is, is why should Debian use Upstart? Um, what is it about, why is Upstart the right system for Debian? Um, so the first point is that your system is, in fact, event-based. Whether you like it or not, this is how the kernel has been working for the past decade. This is how UDEV works. Any system that runs UDEV is an event-based system. There are events related to hardware. There are events related to, to network changes. Um, all of this is event-based. Uh, and so what Upstart does is it provides um, a system that's, that's low impedance with respect to how the underlying uh, kernel and, and um, UDEV architecture works. It provides a, an init system that works along with that and provides a consistent view all the way up the stack, even up in the case of upstart user sessions, all the way up to the, to the user session where users can, can write jobs without any privileges and you know, react to hardware events. Um, so you know, it, it, it's, it's symmetric. It, uh, the Linux kernel is event-based, UDEV is event-based, Dbus, anything that happens on Dbus, these are events. We live in a, an event-based universe, and this is the, the, the init system for an event-based universe. Um, furthermore, where's the, ah yes, uh, it's also, it's simple, it doesn't require a dependency solver like dependency based systems. It means that there is obviously complexity in the system. We move that complexity out of PID1. Um, we're not doing dependency resolution in PID1. Um, uh, well granted, so for sys5 in it, the dependency resolution doesn't happen in PID1 either. Um, you, you have start par and int serve for sys5 in it as, as an overlay that provides that functionality. But it does mean that um, we, we provide an awful lot of power in PID1 without having to have a whole lot of complexity. Upstart just deals with events and it deals with processes and, and there's some, you know, some nice features around that regarding how you start the processes and, and you know, truding, set UID limits, those kinds of things. But it's all, it's managing processes, handling events and that's it. Um, so any, any complexity about building up chains of events just requires you to write jobs that key on events. Uh, it's also reliable. Um, Mount all, there was, there, there, I, I believe we have a philosophical disagreement with the System D uh, developers regarding whether Mount all is a hack. I did have a look at System D's source code and I do see there are references to FS check in the System D PID1 source code. Um, so, you know, the fact that FS check is handled somewhat specially and in the case of Upstart happens to be handled out of process um, it's a design decision, um, but in terms of what Mount Hall gives you, it's a lot of power that uh, manages to successfully handle all kinds of, of boot scenarios. Um, we have correct implementations for LVM, crypt setup, you know, software raid, um, NFS is handled fine. Um, was tricky to get right, I'll be honest, but uh, it is implemented and, and that code is, is available and tested today uh, in Ubuntu. Um, yeah, uh, jobs can react immediately, they will block the boot. So when we say the block the boot, one of the things is Mountall will mount file systems in parallel. Um, oh, we are running over time, so I'm just going to actually speed this along here uh, so we can take some questions at the end. Um, so Mountall will block um, emitting general file system events. So like there's an event that Mountall emits which is local file systems and file system and uh, virtual file systems and a few other things like that, remote file systems, which are events that, that say, yes, I'm done mounting the local file system. And those events don't happen until all, anything that keys on a mounted event is finished. Uh, but the other nice thing is that you can trigger on mounting. So one of the things, about, like I mentioned NFS specifically, one of the problems is getting all of the RPC related services to start up in the right order and also to start up quickly so you're not waiting around. So if your network 
happens to be racing your file system, and the network comes up and something says, ah, I've got a network, let's go ahead and start all the network file systems, and you don't have your RPC services ready to go, and you're trying to mount NFS on boot, everything falls over in a heap with this 5 init. In fact, there, you know, there's, there's some, some lovely hacks in the, uh, the NFS common package in, in Debian right now, which uh, I just learned don't work with startpar, because startpar outsmarts the NFS common package, and so it's not actually doing what it's meant to do. Um, Mount all avoids all that. It, it makes sure that we run everything once in the right order. And, you know, flexibility. So you can, you can stick another job in, in front, behind, whatever, wherever it might go. Um, but, you know, that talks in general terms about why we think Upstart's design is good. I also wanted to point out specifically, this solves real problems, including some very long-standing problems in Debian. There are some very old bugs that we have never dealt with. We keep papering on layer after layer of workarounds, and if you've ever actually looked under the hood at things like Etsy network if up.d, some of the crazy stuff that's in there, Etsy rcs.d, the stuff that's, that's in these directories, that's papering over race conditions, that's dealing with restarting things, it's really quite messy. Um, and Upstart lets us get away from all of that, it gets a simple system that does the right thing once, instead of having races, including races that have gone unsolved for years. Um, you know, here's a few examples that we have here. I have a few more here, for instance. Uh, apparently Upstart improves Debian's compatibility with token ring interfaces. So it's not just about new, it's not about new hardware, it's about old hardware too. <laughs> You got rid of token ring in the kernel, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, so regardless, I mean, the, the point is it's not just, this is not a new problem, it's not a, it's, it's not a problem that's specific to, to, you know, futuristic corner cases. This solves a lot of problems we've had for a lot of time and solves them in an elegant fashion. Um, yeah, this one in particular, the, the, the how we start interfaces, network interfaces on boot up is a real ongoing problem. Here's a bug that's been open for seven years, last touched four years ago, and this is a problem that using sys5 in it just is not getting solved. Upstart solves it. This is a non-issue whatsoever with Upstart. Um, couple more, can't, can't unmount file systems cleanly, getting the, the ordering right on, uh, wrong on shutdown where, you know, we're trying to, uh, unmount file systems, that, not network file systems, after we've already turned out the network. Doesn't work so well with some of our network file systems. Uh, that's a problem that, that Upstart solves. Not, I wouldn't say that it solves, it's solved inherently, it's just that Upstart gets the ordering right in a way that has been difficult to do with Sys5 in it. Um, and I even found while I was trawling the BTS, there was an example of, uh, yeah, uh, system debugs. So the, the, the system D implementation still has some issues in Debian, uh, LVM crypt boot hangs, so, um, but also, I mean, Upstart shares Debian values. The, the principle of doing one thing and doing it well is core to the design of, of Upstart. Uh, we only put in PID1 what has to be there, and we, also, we always support upgrades. We will not implement features in Upstart. We will not make Upstart depend on features that are not available in the previous kernel. For the, for the previous release. Um, we're very conservative about extending features. We want to make sure that upgrades continue to work. They're important to, to Ubuntu, just as they are to Debian, um, and this is, a, this is a guarantee we will make. Um, it also is, is coming from a, a, a Debian and Ubuntu mindset. It, the, its handling of configuration files is actually very natural for, for Debian. Um, and so we have, uh, the config files themselves are editable, and so you can use traditional comp file handling there if you need to, but it also supports this override mechanism where you can support user configuration in a separate file and an overlay. And we've had some philosophical discussions on Debian Devel about which, which one you actually want to do in all cases, because sometimes if you have an overlay, that means you have a silent conflict that you've not dealt with at upgrade time. But the functionality is there, the capability is there where you can, you can do that both ways. Um, and it, it's proven technology. You know, it, it's used in millions of systems already. Um, it's been shipped in three long-term support releases for Ubuntu. Uh, the, the first one was on Sys5 compat mode. The second one had some bugs that, that managed to make it into the LTS, and, and so Upstart kind of, you know, had that reputation for being new, new code that was not quite battle-hardened, but um, we've shipped Ubuntu 12.04 now, um, and in 12.04, the kinks have been worked out. 
This is proven technology. There's no, no question about whether this is going to meet the needs of anybody who's running Debian uh, to, to use this as a system. It will handle all the corner cases just fine. So other than that, we have some links up here, um, which we are now short on time. Uh, the slides will be posted on the um, Penta. They're not posted yet, but we are down to less than five minutes, so I think it's time for questions. Uh, so, so just one thing is, uh, uh, the one thing I want to comment on is your example with the, with, uh, the GB, G key on the USB um, key. Uh, uh, you're hooking into the wrong event there, right? You're not hooking into the mount event, you hook into the device event and then you yes. have to sleep five. Yes. I mean, that's a bit of an indication that, that you're not doing things right because you have all these sleep fives. No, you, no, you, it, you, doesn't, it doesn't you, indicate we're not doing things right. It indicates UDISCs isn't doing things right because it's not talking to well, upstart. But so if you, if you look at what systemd does in that area, it's too totally sufficient to just, like, there's an event generated in, in systemd for the mounting, and you can just drop in a, a, a snippet into the dot mount, uh, no, in the whatever your mount is right. called, dot once um, a directory, and then it's executed as soon as that happens. Sure, but, but I mean, the mounting is not handled by by upstart in this case, because we're using UDISCs, which is upstream free desktop sure, technology, and system, UDISCs system is not talking to us. doesn't require that. That's a nice thing. So, so you, thing you, would, you, you would argue the init system should synthesize events in response to UDISC taking the action? No, systemd does know nothing about UDISCs. It's about like, um, you, you talk about all the event stuff, but you don't actually generate those events, right? Because it's, you get a kernel event if you mount the stuff, so you should be hooking into that. Um, but anyway, if you, if you look at it from the other way, you have this mount all thing that we already talked about yesterday, right? Um, the problem about mount all is that it only runs at boot time, right? That is a problem, yes. Yes, yeah, so, so um, um, the, the event system, the actual event system of, of Upstart is, is not useful for either the, the latest stuff. Like, like your example sure, sure. is like the best case, how this so No, no, oh, so I, I, I'll freely acknowledge it, the limitations of, 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 uh, of the example that I have there. I think there's more work to be done regarding the event system, especially relating to, to mounting events and mount, mount and unmount handling um, throughout the system. Uh, mount all, you're right, it is currently a, a one-time at boot solution. So any sort of, anything that gets mounted later, it's not currently handed through mount all. And so there is a disconnect there where we do not have a consistent vision and that is something that I want to correct. So I, I think I, I, like to, um, you know, uh, Systemd had their promo talk yesterday. This is Upstart's promo talk, so I, I think there are other things that I want to, uh, to talk about. Um, the most significant obstacle, it seems to me, from a Debian point of view, is the contributor agreement. Mm -hmm. I, I notice you didn't mention that at all. Um, is there any possibility of movement on that? Because that's going to be a big problem for Debian, I think. I'm speaking for many people here. Always about the licenses with you, Ian. Um, <laughs> what is it with Debian and licenses? I don't understand. Um, you bloody well ought to. Sorry? You bloody well ought to by now. <laughs> uh, I didn't see you on Debian Legal helping out. Um, That's not the place the decisions get made, <laughs> is it? No. So uh, the, to make sure everybody understands the, the status of Upstart, um, Canonical has a policy of... of requiring a contributor license agreement, which is not the same thing as copyright assignment, but we do require, um, in terms of upstream contributions, um, anything that's going to be contributed upstream to Upstart does have to be um, granted. Uh, the, uh, a contributor license agreement has to be signed, giving uh, Canonical, as the copyright holder of the, of the overall work, the right to, for instance, relicense. Um, you know, it, it provides for certain capabilities of making sure they can uh, deal with any litigation that might come up. Um, and various other aspects. Um, it's not something that is, is actually negotiable in terms of whether Upstart as an upstream is going to change that license agreement. Um, this is not actually altogether different from lots of other projects that Debian ships. Um, of course, we can compare and contrast with the FSF's position, um, particularly in that FSF is, of course, a Nonprofit um, dedicated to free software, whereas Canonical is a is a corporation, uh, and so I know I recognize that people are are not necessarily um, okay with this, um, but I will point out there's lots of other people in the ecosystem doing this. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but we are running out of time, so uh, I suggest we continue this discussion in the hallway track. 
that the FSF's contributor agreement, the copyright license, the FSF legally bindingly promise not to take anything that you sign over to them in that way non-free. Canonical specifically intend to be able to do that. We've heard Mark Shuttleworth tell us that that's the purpose and that this is a thing that um, you know, companies like Canonical should be allowed to do. So I think he, he was speaking in a general philosophical sense that the CLA, that, that companies, <laughs> that it is something that companies should be allowed to do. Um, well, it's a thing that the canonical contributor agreement allows canonical to do. It does. It and does when Mark, that. who is in charge yes. of canonical, tells us he thinks companies should be allowed to do it, um, when the FSF tell us not only do they not think it's a good idea, they also promise in a legally binding way not to. So that's a very clear distinction. Okay, so submit your patches for upstart. Don't, give, don't sign the CLA and we'll see what happens. Well, well, let's... Well, submit them to the Debian maintainer. So we're out of time. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Please, please, thank, please thank Steve and James for their presentation and we'll continue the discussion later, I'm pretty sure of it. Yeah.